of the court as to our pace. Um, uh, as I have uh, just explained to uh, counsel for the defendants, um, we believe that we are on pace to finish Wednesday uh, of this coming week. Uh, that is, um, uh, we believe that um, we'll be able to complete our case using tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay. Uh, that is true even if we do not do uh, Ms. Zia today. So even if we do, even if I had told the court that we'd hope to get uh, uh, Ms. Zia in today, but even if we don't get her in today, uh, we're still on target to finish on Wednesday. Well, that's fine. Uh, is that a suggestion that we uh, not go beyond four o'clock? No, Your Honor, uh, it, it's <laughs> not. Uh, but I, I did, I did want, um, um, having consulted with counsel for defendants, um, I, I think their cross may very well take us somewhat beyond four o'clock, and I just wanted the court to know that we we could go longer, and uh, Ms. Zia is here, uh, or we. Uh, 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 could go with uh, Ms. Zia sometime tomorrow. Well, let's just see how far we get. And if we can certainly finish uh, Dr. Meyer, that would be most uh, helpful. And if we can get in uh, Ms. Zia, that's all to the better. But uh, let's take one step at a time. Cross-examine. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Meyer. Good afternoon. Are Howard Nielsen for the uh, defendant interveners at yes, Cooper and Kirk. And I have already uh, put a witness binder on your stand. You should have that, and it should also have been given to the court. And I think we have a, a couple of witness binders for opposing. Professor Meyer, could you turn to tab one of the witness binder? Yes. Thank you. You'll find an exhibit there, a document there, pre-marked PX 934. Yes. Can you identify this document? Yes, it's a research article by Evelyn Hooker, published, I believe, in uh, 1954 or so. Are Are you familiar with the study? Yes. Thank you. Now, in his expert report, Professor Herrick uh, said this quote is now considered a classic study and one of the first methodologically rigorous examinations of the mental health status of homosexuality. Close quote. Uh, are you familiar with Professor Herrick? Yes. Do you agree with that characterization of the study? Can you repeat just the characterization? Yes. I, I, he said it's now considered a classic study and one of the first methodologically rigorous examinations of the mental health status of homosexuality. Yes. Now, according to Professor Herrick, quote, Dr. Evelyn Hooker administered a battery of widely used psychological tests to groups of homosexual and heterosexual males who were matched for age, IQ, and education. The men were recruited from non-clinical settings. None of the men was in therapy at the time of the study. The heterosexual and homosexual groups did not differ significantly in their overall psychological adjustment as rated by independent experts who were unaware of each man's sexual orientation. Do you agree with that description of the study's results? Yes. Is, is, is there not some tension between Dr. Hooker's conclusions and your opinions that LGB individuals suffer from a higher prevalence of adverse mental health outcomes than heterosexuals? Not at all. It, Please turn to tab three in the witness binder. And you will, you will see a, a document that is pre-marked DIX 1247. By the way, are you moving in 934? Uh, it's already coming. Yeah, in. so I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I will ask that, I, that that be admitted. 934 is admitted. And I apologize for not doing that at the first. Okay, Your Honor, uh, or, or excuse me, Professor uh, Meyer. Now, this, can you identify this article? 
Which exhibit is it? Uh, tab three. It's exhibit DIX 1247. Okay. Yes. This is my article. And in fact, it's the same article we ta you talked about on your direct examination. Correct. correct? And uh, I happen to hear ha both defendants and plaintiffs separately designated this. I have my copy in front of me. I I will move it into evidence just as an abundance of caution in case. There no. <laughs> okay. It, it came in, however, as plaintiffs. It's P PX1003, uh, zero zero Your Honor. Fine. Thank you. That's okay. Refer to it as that. All right. Now, I'd like you to look at page 683 of the article, and that's going by the uh, pagination from the journal that it was published yes. in. And I'm going to read to you just a few passages from this page just to explore, explore your opinions that you expressed in this article. At the very first, the top of the first column, you write, despite a long history of interest in the prevalence of mental disorders among gay men and lesbians, methodologically sound epidemiological studies are rare. The interest in mental health of lesbians and gay men has been clouded by shifts in the social environment within which it was embedded. Before the 1973 declassification of homosexuality as a mental disorder, gay affirmative psychologists and psychiatrists sought to refute arguments that homosexuality should remain a classified disorder by showing that homosexuals were not more likely to be mentally ill than heterosexuals. Now, you wrote that, correct? Yes. And, and you believe that's correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now, skip down to the next paragraph. About the middle of the paragraph, it's, uh, well, it says, in the social atmosphere of the time. Do you see that line? I'm going to read that. It's about the middle of the next yes. paragraph. In the social atmosphere of the time, research findings were interpreted by gay affirmative researchers conservatively so as to not erroneously suggest that lesbians and gay men had high prevalences of disorder. Now, again, you wrote that, correct? Yes. And you agree with that? I wrote the entire article. Yes, okay. Well, I... I, <laughs> I that, that, then you are different from some of the professors I had. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to... Uh... All right, and, and then, now at the bottom of that paragraph it says, thus most reviewers have concluded that research evidence has conclusively shown that homosexuals did not have abnormally elevated psychiatric symptomatology compared with heterosexuals. This conclusion has been widely accepted and has been often restated in most current psychological and psychiatric literature. Correct? Yes. Now, you believe that, that this, quote, widely accepted and, quote, often restated view is incorrect. Well, I believe that... That w this widely accepted and uh, often restated view is incorrect. I mean, I, I believe that it was, as I said here, well, you mean whether... The, the view that homosexuals did not have abnormally elevated psychiatric symptomatology compared with heterosexuals, that you said that view is widely accepted and often restated. Do you believe that view is incorrect? I said that it was in the past. Okay, it was in the past. My question, though, is do you believe that is incorrect, that view? I have to explain the context of those studies because... Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I am going to move things along. You, you had a chance to explain your views at length on direct, right. and if opposing counsel thinks it's necessary, you can have an opportunity on redirect. But right now, I, I really just want to know yes or no. Did you, do you believe that view, that past view, if you will, is incorrect? I'm sorry, I cannot answer it like that because we're talking about uh, what we call different generations of studies, and um, it, it just, if I could explain, I would explain, but, but uh, for example, Evelyn Hooker's study was correct, so if you ask me do I feel that it was not correct, it was correct, but I don't think that it addressed the question that you were asking me about the prevalence of disorders. Well, what I'm asking is, do you believe that, the, in your own words, you said homosexuals did not have abnormally elevated psychiatric symptomatology compared with heterosexuals? Do you believe that it is, that it is correct that homosexuals do not have abnormally elevated psychiatric symptomatology compared with heterosexuals? I don't believe that, as I 
describe the evidence today. So you believe that is incorrect? As of today, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, that view is in, inconsistent with your testimony in this case, correct? Not the view you just expressed, the view that's supported here. The view that, here. right, my view is, or, or my uh, research evidence that is recent uh, has shown that, that, in fact, gay and lesbian population do have higher rates of some disorders. And so that opinion is inconsistent with, with what you said was once the widely accepted and often restated view. Correct. correct. Thank you. All right, now look at the next paragraph. The very first lines, you say, more recently, there has been a shift in the popular and scientific discourse on the mental health of lesbians and gay men. Gay affirmative advocates have begun to advance a minority stress hypothesis, claiming that discriminatory social conditions lead to poor health outcomes. Correct? Yes. All right, and that, that is your position, correct? Yes. Thank you. And I notice you used the, that one of the citations, in fact, after that sentence is to your own work, correct? This is Meyer 2001. Correct. So you consider yourself a, quote, gay affirmative advocate, correct? I, I'm considering myself a gay affirmative uh, uh, scientist, and I certainly advocate for um, the, the, the improvement of the social environment for gay men and lesbians. Yes, yes and, and the exact words you used here were gay affirmative advocates, and you use that in connection with the citation to yourself. So do you believe yourself to be a gay affirmative advocate? Among other things that I am, such as a social scientist. So yes, correct? Uh, yes. All right, thank you. And, and in fact, you contributed money to the No on 8 campaign, correct? Y yes. In fact, you did so on two occasions, correct? I don't remember, but I did uh, contribute to them because I thought that the cause was uh, All right. something that I agree with. Thank you. And please look at tab number four. Uh, this is something we got off the San Francisco Chronicles database that tracked the Proposition 8 contributions. Does, does this reflect your recollection about your contributions to Proposition 8, to the no uh, one it, campaign? It's I don't have independent recollection, but I, I don't have any reason to doubt it either, so. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, in, in your testimony, writings, and uh, the expert report that I read, I, I noticed that sometimes you refer to the minority stress model, and sometimes you refer to the social stress model. For purposes of your opinions in this case, are those synonyms? No. Are they essentially synonyms for purposes of your opinion here? Well, one is a case of the other. So the, they refer to similar theories, but the minority stress per se is the theory that I described earlier uh, uh, as I described those stressors that are specific to gay and lesbians. But it's the social stress is kind of like a broader category that would fit in it. So I don't know if you want to say that that's a synonym or not. but but. The minority stress is one of the models that are used uh, as a within the, I would say, rubric of social stress. When, when we're talking about stress received by disadvantaged groups, would the social stress theory or the social stress model and the minority stress model be synonyms? I think, uh, as I just explained, the, the minority stress is usually used to gain lesbian population because, for example, it has things like internalized homophobia or that are specific. But in the social stress, for example, with African Americans, I would say the most prominent article discussed uh, racism is stress, which is okay, but a so parallel, I guess. Uh, the minority stress is a subset of social stress. Right, okay, right. Okay, thank you. And sometimes you use the word minority stress theory, sometimes you say minority stress model. Is that essentially synonymous? Um, yes, the, the, the theory, yes, I Thank guess. Thank you. All right, I, I just wanted to clarify that because you use the, these wor different words in some of your articles and I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Sure. Now the social stress model, or, or if you will, the minority stress model, predicts the individuals who are members of disadvantaged groups receive more stress than individuals who are not in those groups. Oh, I'm sorry. The social stress model, 
or the minority stress model, I, I guess I should say the minority stress model, predicts that individuals who are members of disadvantaged groups receive more stress than individuals who are not members of those groups, correct? Yes, and, and that will be true of the social stress as well. You know. Okay, so that's, in that case, they're synonyms. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. And the model predicts that as a result of social stress or as a result of minority stress, individuals who are members of disadvantaged groups will have worse mental health outcomes than individuals who are not members of those groups, correct? Yes. All right. And at least as a theoretical matter, those two premises should apply to other disadvantaged groups, correct? Th that, I would say, is a question that is of great interest, but I cannot say correct or incorrect on the way that you described it. Okay, even as a theoretical matter, you can't say that that's correct. As a theoretical matter, we look at commonalities and divergences across populations in order to probe our theories and to understand how things work. So there, there are commonalities as the way that you describe them, yes. And there, you also, there are also dissimilarities, of course, so we, we, we try to analyze the balance of those and learning about uh, theoretical issues. Okay, I, I would like you to turn to tab number eight. in the witness binder. Yes. Yes, and you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 2519. Yes. Can you identify that document? Yes, that's an interview that um, I, 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 I was interviewed by uh, this person, David Van Nies, and uh, I believe it's a, a um, transcription of that interview. It was, a, it was a oral, you know, internet yes, radio th interview. Thank you. And in that interview, you discuss some of the studies and work that you've conducted, correct? Yes. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, I would like to move DIX 2519 into evidence. Very well. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. And I would like to, um, to look at uh, the third page of the exhibit. Yes. Oh, yes, sorry. I, now, I, I want to look at the second to the bottom paragraph on that page. And it says, quote, so some of the findings that we had, for example, is when we look at stre the stress exposure. So we wanted to study each aspect of this theory because a lot of the elements of the stress theory, especially when it comes to social stress, are often assumed but not tested. And you wanted to test carefully the entire process. So the first hypothesis, you know, is a pretty big hypothesis. There are a lot of different studies about that. Is do disadvantaged groups, in fact, have more stress? Correct. So that, 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 um, that doesn't distinguish uh, gays and lesbians from other disadvantaged groups, correct? Right, that will be a general test of the social stress model. Uh, as you said, the first assumption is that disadvantage is associated with added stress. Right, r right. And I'd like to go up on the, earlier on that page, your second full response. You say, so around this, I designed the study, and the study included 524 men and women who were New York City residents. And there were people who were in those different groups that we can identify based on this so that we can test this theory. So they were gay and lesbian, bisexual versus heterosexual. They were women versus men, and they were black and Latino versus white. And we looked at those three disadvantaged statuses and to what extent those disadvantaged statuses are related to an increase in stressors, as the theory would say, and to what extent, if they do have those increases in stressors, do they, in fact, lead to certain mental disorders? Yes. So at least as a theoretical matter, the social stress theory would predict that for each of those three groups, the, the disadvantaged group would experience more stress and have worse mental health outcomes, correct? Correct. All right, thank you. All right. And um, now, now turning back to LGB, the LGB individuals in particular, you, you believe that as a result of, well, you believe that due in part to minority stratus, the LGB population has about twice as many 
mental health disorders as heterosexuals, including mood, anxiety, and substance use disorders, correct? Yes. And you also believe that the LGB population suffers from a higher prevalence of mood, anxiety, or substance use problems that do not meet criteria for a formal psychiatric disorder, but are nevertheless indicative of stress, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. And you also believe that LGB individuals have lower levels of well-being than heterosexuals, correct? Yes. And you believe there's a higher incidence of suicide attempts among LGB individuals compared to heterosexual individuals, correct? Uh, you believe that there's a higher incidence of suicide attempts among LGB individuals than among heterosexual individuals? Yes. Okay. And where one LGB individual suffers from minority stress, it would tend to affect the other partner as well, correct? Uh, when it, when it, let, me, let, let me rephrase that. When an LGB individual is in a relationship, intimate relationship with another individual, uh, where, where one LGB individual suffers from minority stress, it would tend to affect the other partner as well, correct? I think that's true of all partners. When something bad happened to one of them, surely it will affect them. So, so yes, the correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, I just would say it's not unique to LGB in okay. this case. It's not unique, but it would be true. Sure. Okay, I, thank you. I, I, I assume, you know, it's kind of theoretical. I would assume that it would affect the other person, too, who's, uh, if his loved one experienced something. Sure. And, and sp specifically, if uh, one of the members of the partnership it, or the marriage, wh whatever it might be, if they suffered, from, one member suffered from minority stress, it, it would increase general stress on the relationship and would have a ne negative impact on their satisfaction, correct? Yes. Some, some of the stressors, you know, th this is in general kind of on average, uh, so some of those stressors would definitely have this effect. And, and I particularly studied internalized homophobia as an example of that type of effect, but there might be more minor things that may not have this effect. Okay, thank you. Now, you believe that the adverse mental health outcomes among the LGB population that you believe you have identified are due in part to minority stress, correct? Yes. I, I Emphasis just, on due in part. Yeah. It's not that I identified all those differences. There, this, there are many studies, and even in the article that we just discussed, I rely on other studies by summarizing them. But correct. Yes, but yes. My question is really getting. Can I object to the counsel is interrupting the answers? I think if there's a question in the witness and answer, uh, please be permitted. Uh, all right. I'll try and be careful. I, I just am trying to move things along. But all right. Well, <clears throat> maybe you can point your questions, and the witness can point his answers. Hopefully, you'll meet in the middle. <laughs> I was just making the point that uh, you said that I found those, uh, uh, the evidence about a higher prevalence, and I just made the point that this is not all my studies. Right, thank you, and, and I appreciate your making that clear. I, my question, though, what I'm really getting at is these mental health outcomes can also result from other causes, correct? Yes. And some of those causes would be unrelated to stress, correct? Yes. And some, even for stress-related causes, some of those stressors would be not related to minority stress, correct? Yes. General stressors, I think, you, is the term you used. Yes. Correct? Okay, thank you. And, and those sorts of general stressors are not dependent on membership in a disadvantaged group, correct? Correct. All right. At least as a theoretical matter, the social stress model would predict that women experience more stress than men, correct? It's correct with some, uh, um, it's correct that we would look for that prediction, yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, in this, in your, this interview, as you describe your work, you actually found that men and women did not have different levels of overall stress, correct? Yes. And this is something that's also found in the general literature, correct? Yes. So regarding gender, the expectations of social stress theory that the disadvantaged group, in this case women, would have more exposure to stress is not verified by your studies, correct? 
And this expectation of the social stress theory regarding women is not verified by many other studies either, correct? Yes. Thank you. And the social stress model would predict that African Americans and Latinos suffer from a higher prevalence of mental disorders than non-Hispanic whites, correct? As a group, yes. Thank you. Now, in the study that you describe in this interview, you in fact found that African Americans and Latinos do not have more stress, or excuse me, they do have more stress than non-Hispanic whites, correct? Correct. But you found that African Americans and Latinos do not have more mental disorders than whites, correct? Correct. And this is a finding that's not unique to this study, correct? Yes. And this finding seems to be valid because it's been shown with other populations in general studies, correct? I think yeah, other populations, you mean uh, that study the same thing? Other studies, yeah. Yes, okay. I, I was actually just quoting directly from your words. In yeah, the other, other studies that use other samples and so forth, yeah. Yes. Now please look at the third paragraph of your first full answer on page four. And again, we're still in this interview you gave. And it starts with however. Can you see that, Professor Meyer? Page four. Page four, it's the, yes. your first full answer. It's about the middle of the page. And I'm going to read that to you. You say, however, regarding the blacks and Latinos, we found an interesting finding. And in fact, that just repeats what I said, so I'm, I'm going to skip to the middle where it says, so blacks and Latinos have more stress, but they don't have more mental disorders. So that's very bewildering again from the social stress perspective because you question whether your theory is correct. If they have more stress and the stress is a cause of disorders, which is what this whole study is about, then how come they don't show more disorders? Okay, now, now those, you wrote that, correct? Yes. Well, that you've said it probably because it was an interview. Right, but, but yes, I've probably written something like that as well. Okay, and uh, the social stress model would also predict that within the LGB community, African Americans and Latino LGB individuals would suffer from a higher prevalence of mental disorders than white non-Hispanic individuals. Correct. I'm sorry, the, the, the study that you quoted before was about African-American and Latino gay and lesbian people. Yes, I, I, I see. Are you asking a different? Well, in the, in the study we just talked about, um, you said this was true in the general population right. as well. Right, so correct? it's true. But, but the study that I conducted was about a black and Latino okay. gay men and lesbians as compared to white, gay men, and lesbians. All right. Yeah, and I want to look at another study you did that's, uh, more, that's clearly more clearly pointed just at that within the LGB group. But I, I take your point, so thank okay. you for clarifying that. But let, let, let me ask one clarifying question. But the general pattern you said in this article is true for non-LGB individuals as well, correct? For both men versus women and for the ethnicity and race groups. I would, I would limit it to African Americans versus okay. white because it's a little complicated with Latinos, but uh, yes, for okay, the African thank Americans you. versus white. Okay, but, but the social stress model would predict that within the LGB community, um, African American and Latino LGB individuals would suffer from a higher prevalence of mental disorders than white non-Hispanic LGB individuals, correct? That, that was a hypothesis that we tested, yes. Thank you. And it's, you tested that because that's what the social stress theory or the minority stress theory would predict, correct? We tested because we want to see whether that is, but there's actually an alternative prediction too, so uh, um, it's a little bit more complex than the way you're describing it, but um, we, we test a hypothesis because we always pose one side of the hypothesis. In fact, in this matter of gay and lesbian, uh, uh, which we call kind of having dual minority identities, the one th theory or one hypothesis is that they would have more because they now have two uh, kind of minority identities or disadvantaged identities. But the, uh, the other theory was that they actually would do better because somehow their experiences as black and uh, 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 exposed to racism would somehow uh, give them special coping abilities so that when they deal with the gay uh, uh, homophobia that they can somehow do better. So those are the two sides and we certainly pose the hypothesis as one-sided when we test it. 
Okay, and I would, uh, well, two questions. First of all, do you consider that a very parsimonious explanation? And I don't mean your words. I mean as a theoretical matter. Is that a parsimonious theory? <laughs> parsimonious in what way? The way you use it in the social sciences. And you have used that word. Uh, exactly, but I've used it in different contexts. So, um, uh, to, My understanding is that parsimonious means simple, and that in the social sciences, in science in general, a simpler answer is preferred to a more complex one, as long as they both fit the data. Is that correct? Do you want me to say if that is preferable in social sciences? Yes. Uh, there's disagreements about that. So uh, a more parsimonious explanation is preferable if you look to kind of, a, in some ways, you know, you're looking for the pithiest and most uh, uh, um, simple, as you said, explanation that can explain the widest phenomena. But the, on the other side of parsimony, there uh, uh, people and, and this, you know, the study that of philosophy and of sciences that say that uh, parsimony is not good because it doesn't allow you to understand the details and the working so that it that, that it could oversimplify. In other words, All right. so so that is a debatable thing. But um, certainly, we're interested in those questions of parsimony in the way that maybe you refer okay. to. Uh, so we're interested in those questions. We want to see, is it parsimony? Is it explaining across situation and across uh, uh, populations and so forth? It's uh, certainly uh, what makes my work interesting. OK, thank you. Now please look at uh, tab 9 in the witness binder. And uh, you'll find a document that's pre-marked DIX 12. 53? Yes. Can you identify this document? Yes, that's an article that I published uh, in the American Journal of Public Health in 2008. Thank you. And, Your Honor, I would like to introduce DIX 1253 into evidence. No objection. 1253 is admitted. Thank you. And, and this document describes a study that you conducted, correct? Yes. Thank you. And uh, please look at. Um, the top, there are three columns actually, but look in the first page, the top of the first column, or the th second column, the middle column. Mm -hmm. And now you stated a minute ago that you were, you were not inclined to agree with my statement that the social stress theory would predict that uh, black and Latino lesbian, well, LGB individuals would have more mental disorders than than white, non-Hispanic, LGB individuals. But I'd like to read that to you. It says, social stress theories. I, I don't think I said that. Oh, do you agree uh, with that? Uh, can you repeat it? OK, the social stress model would also predict that within the LGB community, African American and Latino LGB individuals would suffer from a higher prevalence of mental disorders than white, non-Hispanic individuals, correct? Y yes, I said that was the hypothesis we tested. OK. So I, I didn't disagree with that, but I also said that there there's, the, there's a debate you know, that we try to address in studying this topic. So there's one side and the other side. In terms of that dual identity, that's what I was saying earlier. So that was the hypothesis we tested. Yes, as and, you and I, it. sorry. Are, are you, are, are you, have you completed your answer? Yes. I apologize. Uh, now, the first sentence there says, social stress theories lead us to expect that compared with socially advantaged groups, disadvantaged groups are at a higher risk for mental disorders. Yes. You agree with that statement, correct? Yes. So we thus hypothesized, one, that black and Latino lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals have more mental disorders than do white lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals because they're more exposed to more stress related to prejudice, discrimination, excuse me, prejudice and discrimination associated with their race, ethnicity. Correct. All right. And you believe that hypothesis followed from the social stress theory, correct? Yes. Thank you. All right. And in, in this study, you found that African Americans and Latino lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals did not have a higher disorder prevalence than did white participants, correct? Yes, 
And in this study, you found that African-American and Latino lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals did not have a higher disorder prevalence than did white participants, correct? Than the white the, lesbian, gay men, and bisexuals. Correct. The, and I guess the white, non-Hispanic, lesbian, gay men, bisexuals. Right. Right. And, and this finding was contrary to your hypothesis, correct? Right. All right. Thank you. And you found that African-American lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals had significantly fewer disorders than did white participants, correct? I think in some of the uh, findings that was significantly fewer, yes. Okay, and uh, let's look at um, let's look at page uh, this first page in the third column, and uh, I'll read starting with the second uh, par the second sentence. It says, contrary to our hypothesis, black and Latino lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals did not have a higher disorder prevalence than did white participants. Indeed, black lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals had significantly fewer disorders than uh, did white participants. Right, the the black. Okay, so so that is correct. Yes, but the yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, you found that the prevalence of disorders among Lat Latino lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals was similar to that of white lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals. Correct. Slow down. Okay, sorry. And you found that the prevalence of disorders among Latino le lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals was similar to that of white lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals, correct? With the exception of serious suicide attempts, that is correct. But uh, we've, we found them to have higher uh, prevalence of serious suicide attempts in, in history. But, but not of uh, disorders generally, correct? Of the, those three disorders, right. Okay, thank you. And men and women did not differ substantially in disorder prevalence, correct? Correct. So in terms of uh, implications to social stress theory, this study reported inconsistent findings, correct? Within the context of these particular questions that were raised in this study, but it is not inconsistent with the general, uh, uh, what I, testified to, which was about the difference between gay and lesbian and heterosexual. So within that gay and lesbian group, there was not the finding that supported the idea that if you have an added, uh, a uh, sorry, an added minority identity, that that will add more disorders to. But but as a group, they had more disorders than heterosexuals. Correct, but the which is not reported here because this is just looking at one particular aspect of it. But the results regarding race, ethnicity were inconsistent with your predictions made on the basis of social stress theory, correct? Again, within the context of that, yes. Thank you. And these results regarding race and ethnicity were inconsistent with others' predictions made on the basis of social stress theory, correct? With, uh, where, where is it? With other peoples, yes. Yes, thank you. And you found it notable that the race ethnicity patterns reported here among lesbians, gay men, and bisexual individuals were similar to race differences found among heterosexual individuals in general population studies, correct? Yes, but again, as a group, they were all elevated, but the differences within the group of gay men, lesbians, were um, consistent in that sense of that hypothesis that I tested, although there were some differences, but. I don't but, think it's relevant to what you're asking. About. Right, no, I understand. And, and you stated that you believe that further research needs to explain the seeming contradiction of social stress predictions, correct? Absolutely. We always think that further research is necessary. Yes, that's... That's yeah. what we do. That's how you stay in business. <laughs> well, and, and some lawyers predict that litigation is always necessary, <laughs> too. But... Uh, Thank you. The, the social stress model would also predict that within the LGB community, racial and ethnic minorities would suffer from lower levels of well-being than whites, correct? Yes, yeah, the same rationale. And the social stress model would predict that within the LGB community, racial and ethnic minorities would suffer from a higher prevalence of depression than whites, correct? Uh, I think, is it repeating the same thing we discussed? Because 
I, I, I just asked you about mental disorders, which I understood it to be the subject of the study we just read. Now right. I'm asking about well-being first and then suicide attempts second. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So uh, regarding well-being, again, yep. it will be the same basic pattern. You would, on one hand, the, the, the social stress part of it would say they have another minority identity, therefore they should have more disorder. The coping, I guess, hypothesis you can say would say the opposite. And uh, with regard to suicide, um, th th yes, you would expect them to have more. Okay. So the answer is that the social model, the stress model would predict that within the LGB community, racial and ethnic minorities would suffer from a higher prevalence of depression than whites. Yes. It's correct. And, and I apologize. I, I misspoke. The study I'm going to look at now, next is about depression and well-being. Okay. And. Okay, thank you. Now, please turn to tab 10 in the witness binder. You will find a, a document that's pre-marked uh, DIX 1252. And uh, can you identify this document? Yes, that's an, another study from the same, uh, sorry, another uh, paper that was published from the same study. Uh, looking at uh, different outcomes that you just mentioned, actually, and uh, it was published in the American Journal of Auto Psychiatry in 2009. Okay, and uh, thank you. And, and the, Your Honor, this is also uh, an exhibit that was uh, designated by both parties. I believe the plaintiffs designated it as exhibit number 999, and it may have been among that list that uh, Mr. Dussault submitted, though I, I can't recall. It is. Okay, thank you. So, I. So that's it. It's in. All right, thank you. Now, this document describes another study you have conducted, correct? It's the same study. It's a different analysis on the same popul the same sample uh, um, that was in the other s paper we just discussed. So it's the same people, but a different outcome, as you mentioned. All right, so it's... Uh, same study, but a different aspect of that study. Exactly. Correct? All right, thank you. And uh, in this study, you did not find decreased well-being or increased depression in racial ethnic minority respondents as a whole, correct? In the, again, those are the gain that's beyond black, and it is, yes, and consistent, consistent with what we were just saying with the other study, yes. Right. And this finding was contrary to your hypotheses stemming from minority stress theory about the added stress that racial ethnic minority status would place on LGB individuals. Okay. And this finding was contrary to your hypotheses stemming from minority stress theory about the added stress that racial ethnic minority status would place on LGB individuals, correct? Yes. Your finding regarding mental health and well-being of African American LGB persons is consistent with results of studies of the general population that found that despite greater exposure to discrimination and prejudice, African Americans do not have a higher prevalence of most common mental disorders than whites, correct? Yes. The studies have found that this is true with respect to both the general population and LGB populations, correct? Again, it's correct in the sense of black versus white LGB, but the LGB versus heterosexuals, which is what I was uh, uh, testifying to, that was higher. Uh, but but uh, in the general population, meaning non or not necessarily gay samples, the finding is that, as you described it. Okay, and, and we, we will turn to the studies with of heterosexuals versus uh, LGB individuals immediately after this okay. exhibit, but I, I, I'm testing the minority stress theory generally, which is why I'm exploring some of the work you've done okay. relating to gender and race. Now, um, other studies have shown that African Americans, in fact, have higher self-esteem and well-being than whites, correct? It's in the general population. Yes. Yes. Now look at page eight of this exhibit. And again, we're at tab 10. And uh, starting about halfway 
down in the middle of the paragraph at the bottom of the second column. I'm going to read that to you. It says that our results show inconsistent support for minority stress hypotheses should lead to a re-examination and, if necessary, elaboration of the minority stress model. We are particularly struck by the finding that black LGB respondents, clearly a disadvantaged social group in American society, do not show higher levels of depressive symptoms and lower levels of well-being than their white counterparts. This finding clearly challenges minority stress theory. That this finding is consistent with findings about black-white differences in well-being in the general population, as well as findings regarding differences in prevalence of mental disorders between black and white LGB, strengthens our confidence that these findings are not a result of some bias in our study. Those are your words, correct? And does, yes. that, does that fairly summarize? Uh, that, that's business? one of the uh, conclusions that we came to, yes. Okay, and, and turn over the page to the next paragraph, the, the top of the page nine in the first column. It says, the lack of parsimony in our results represents a challenge in social stress theory. It suggests that the theory cannot be applied uniformly and that greater definitions and distinctions are necessary in future research, correct? Correct. And, and, we, and we discussed parsimony a minute ago, correct? It, it, it is saying exactly what I said, that I, I, I guess the word challenge needs to be extended. When, what, I, what I'm saying here is that we need to examine because of those differences in the commonalities and divergences, we need to try to better, uh, we would call it specify the model, that it'll be a better model predicting those types of outcomes so that they, so we can explain them better. But, but you said that it, it means that the theory cannot be applied uniformly and that greater definition and distinctions are necessary, correct? Exactly. All right, thank you. Please turn to tab 11 in the witness binder. And you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1246. Can you identify this document? 1246? Yes. It's page, tab 11. Yes, that's an article that I wrote uh, that was published in the Journal of Health and Social Behavior in 1995. Thank you. And it's, uh, again, this is one that was designated by the plaintiffs as 1002, Your Honor. And I, I believe it is in evidence. Very well. Correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. 1002, PX1002 is. Did is, uh, I have uh, opposing counsel confirm that that was admitted? or? The, yes. 1002? Yes. Is in. Is in. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, this document discusses a study you conducted, correct? Yes. This was my dissertation study. This, this was your doctoral dissertation, you said? This was based on the dissertation. This is a publication that came out of it, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, now let's look at uh, page 39 in the middle of the set, well, towards the top of the second column, about three sentences into the first full paragraph. You write, it has been predicted that if minority position is stressful and if the stress is related to psychological distress, then minority groups must have higher rates of distress than non-minority groups. But studies that compared rates of distress and disorder between blacks and whites, women and men, and homosexuals and heterosexuals did not confirm such predictions, leading some researchers to refute minority stress conceptualizations. And the study goes on to list a number of citations, a number of studies, including, I, I believe I count nine on, quote, gay-straight differences, correct? Right. So those studies at least do not support the social stress model as it applies to LGB individuals, correct? Those are the studies that I was referring to before when you asked me the questions about Evelyn Hooker and so forth that are in the past uh, demonstrated that. And as I also said in many of the publications that the studies uh, in the 90s are the ones that began to use more advanced uh, accepted methods that begin to show this difference. And in fact, the point of this article is to show the support for minority stress. And, and this is the article that actually I first introduced the concept and demonstrated how it, it does work. 
in, in our work. They support it. So th this was just the introduction to this. All right, thank you. But, but these studies that you cite here, you characterize as studies that compared rates of distress and disorder between homosexuals and heterosexuals and did not confirm such predictions. And the predictions to which you're referring it, earlier in that sentence are, it has been predicted that if minority position is stressful and if this stress is related to psychological stress, then minority groups must have higher rates of distress than non-minority groups, correct? So, so those older studies did not show that, as, as we okay. showed yesterday, uh, sorry, <coughs> not All right, so, so those studies at least were inconsistent with your model, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. And your, your 1995 study did not look at intergroup comparisons, correct? By intergroup comparisons, I mean comparisons between heterosexuals and, homose and uh, LGB individuals. No, I did this most fully in the 2003 article that we discussed earlier. Yes, but in 1995 you did not, correct? This was a, a looking at a group of gay men. And uh, in fact, in that article you stated that uh, later, just lower down on the page, you say, I suggest that we must re-examine re our reliance on evidence from intergroup comparisons of rates of distress. Despite the intuitive appeal of this approach, numerous methodological problems lead to bias, making it difficult to interpret the evidence from studies using this approach, correct? So, so <laughs> this refers to, you know, we, we refer to different generations of studies in psychiatric epidemiology. There was a huge shift in understanding how to do studies like that. So I'm saying here what I said he, in that, what you're quoting, that those older R articles are not a good indication for the assessment of those differences because they didn't use uh, sampling methodologies that would be correct, that would allow us to make, the, to draw those conclusions. They didn't at the time have diagnostic criteria that were that clear and they certainly did not have any measures to assess those. So there were a lot of methodological problems in those earlier studies, including the studies that we were discussing earlier when uh, you quoted some of the, again, early studies that, that do not talk to the effect of prevalence. So they would have been two groups of gay versus straight, but they were not studies of prevalence in the population. So therefore, they're not reliable as an estimate of the difference in the prevalence. Okay, but you said that uh, you suggest, uh, uh, quote, I suggest that we must re-examine our reliance on ev evidence from intergroup comparisons of rates of disorder, correct? Yes, because of that problem and, and, and other uh, issues that I think I list here. Okay, and thank you. And, and that's why you did not conduct an intergroup study in 1995, correct? I, I wouldn't say that is why I didn't conduct it, but, but I was using this uh, uh, study as another anchor on this problem, as, as, as on this question. As I said, we use, we try to use different approaches to study the same problem from different sides so that we can see convergences and uh, inconsistencies so that we can, by, by looking at those, improve our way that we understand the problem and the theories. That is not unique, you know, to, to these studies. For example, uh, uh, there was a time that people thought that uh, all cancers are caused by some kind of uh, genetic uh, mutation, and then uh, they, they find studies that don't confirm that, and therefore they go on and investigate further, and they say, oh, some studies, some, sorry, cancers are caused by an infectious agent. So that's what I mean by improving the, the model. So now we understand something a little better about how cancer is caused. So in the same way, we, we, we always try to challenge our results in our studies using different methodologies, different ways of, of, of assessing the basic theory that, you know, we discussed here, social stress, and, and use it, the, so when I say the word challenge, we use it to further uh, uh, study uh, things that are discovered in, let's say, inconsistencies. So the, the, some of the inconsistencies that you describe are now the subject of further investigation. Okay, thank you. And, but you found your findings in this study contrasted with the previous evidence compiled on minority stress, correct? Well, this study was looking within a group of gay men. It contrasts with those 
older studies that, as I said, did not show the differences, but as I also said, there were studies that were not up to par in terms of how we assess those issues now in terms of their ability to represent the population prevalence or the, the proportion of people in the population that have the disorder. Uh, all right. I'm not asking about the methodology of the previous studies. I'm just asking whether your findings in this study were inconsistent with those studies. I mean, I guess you could I, I think I would say the older studies were inconsistent with this new finding. Okay, and, and please turn to page 51, okay, if you, if you would, please, sir. Yeah. Okay, Professor Meyer, could, let's right in the middle of the second column on page 51, you write, quote, these findings contrast with previous evidence compiled on minority stress. When studies compared rates of disorder or distress between minority and non-minority groups, we found li little evidence that minority stress is related to adverse mental health. Correct? Yes. Those are those old studies that I mentioned. Thank you. And in the last, in the last paragraph of that page, a little farther down, you say, certainly the issue of rates of disorder and distress can not sidestep and will have to be addressed too. But if the present findings are convincing, we must address the question of rates of difference with this evidence in mind. The issue thus becomes one of explaining why there are no differences in rates of disorder between minority and non-minority populations and how such findings could be consistent with the evidence that noxious social conditions do in fact have adverse mental health effects. And you wrote that, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. It's, it's kind of what I was just trying to explain as well. But okay, thank you. Uh, let, let's turn back to tab three. And uh, we, we discussed this document a moment ago, and it's in evidence, so we, we can go straight to it. Tab three, Your Honor. <clears throat> Okay, and in the middle of the pay, and, and this is your 2003 article where you did look at intergroup comparisons, correct? Correct. Yes, thank you. And in the page, middle of... What page? That was just a general question, Your Honor. But uh, pay, now... Are ready to read something? I, I am, and now I, now I will uh, direct, uh, ask you, Professor Meyer, and to turn to page 684. Okay. Please look at the second sentence of the first full paragraph. Okay, it starts in drawing. In, in drawing con a conclusion about whether LGB groups have higher prevalences of mental disorders, one should proceed with caution. The studies are few, methodolo methodologies and measurements are inconsistent, and trends in the findings are not always easy to interpret. Although several studies show significant elevation in prevalence of disorders in LGB people, some do not. So at the time you wrote this, you believed that at least some of the previous studies were inconsistent with the minority stress model, correct? We're talking still about the same studies that were the older studies. And the reason that I did this uh, paper is to use only the better studies, the ones that can actually answer the question, and that's what the findings in this paper demonstrate. Thank you. Now please look at page 685. Um, let's see. Yes, please look at 685 and look at the second full paragraph on the page. You describe well, I'll, I'll just read it. Two, two studies assess the risk for completed suicides among gay men. These studies assess the prevalences of homosexuality among completed suicides and found no overrepresentation of gay and bisexual men, concluding that LGB populations are not an increased risk for suicide. Thus, findings from studies of completed suicides are inconsistent with studies finding that LGB groups are at higher risk of suicide ideation and attempts than heterosexuals. And then in the last sentence of that paragraph, you say, considering the scarcity of studies, the methodological challenges, 
and the greater potential for bias in st studies of completed suicide, it is difficult to draw firm conclusions from their apparent refutation of minority stress theory. Correct? Yes, as you said, this, concern, this concerns a particular type of study that looks at completed suicide, those are people who, who are dead, and therefore um, it is, there are only two of those, and it is very hard to assess the proportion of people there who are gay. So that's why I said that it is hard to draw conclusions for those two studies. But um, at least on their face, they, uh, you describe them as presenting an apparent ref refutation of minority stress theory, correct? App apparent, yes, but I also say in the same paragraph that the methodological problems would preclude from drawing those conclusions. All right. And you said it was uh, considering the scarcity of studies, the methodological challenge and the greater potential for bias, it's difficult to draw firm conclusions. That's correct. About this particular issue of completed suicide. Yes. Thank you. Now, your uh, 2003 study di did conclude that LGB individuals have a higher prevalence of mental disorders than heterosexuals, correct? Yes. Okay. As I said before, this was not my study. This was what we call a meta-analysis, which is a method of gathering data and information from other studies. So I, I looked at the other studies and came out with the statistics that describe the, the, the aggregate of those studies. What, so, so the purpose of that is to get a better handle on those estimates because you're using not just one study but several studies that are available to you. Correct. I, 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 and you... Uh you relied on two types of studies, correct? Uh, studies that targeted LGB groups using non-probability samples and studies that used probability samples of the general populations that allowed identification of LGB versus heterosexual groups, correct? In your meta-analysis. I, I looked at all of those studies, but in conclusions I relied only on the studies that use probability samples. The, the studies that don't use probability samples are exactly the ones we were discussing earlier, which is why I said that you cannot really draw good conclusions from them in terms of estimating prevalence. So I, I looked at, I think, all of the studies that were available going back, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, to the 70s. And uh, so when, I, when, I say, when you say rely, I certainly looked at all of those, but in the meta-analysis, I, as most people do, you create a selection criteria for which studies you want to include, and in this case, they were. Um, I looked specifically at the ones that were community studies that are very large and that involve probability samples, because probability samples allow us to then estimate back into the population the proportions, the, the prevalences, as we call them. So uh, when you say you looked at the first type of non-probability study, but you ultimately didn't rely on that. Is that, is that your explanation? In the, in the meta-analysis. So the meta-analysis was based only on the, um, the well, the, let me get your exact words. It's the, well, the, the non-probability -prob samples of the general population that allowed well, I actually think that I did both, and I show, but but in terms of drawing conclusion, I, I looked at different things. But in terms of drawing conclusions about prevalences, I relied on those studies that are probability studies. Okay, thank thank you. I, I I wasn't clear on that from reading the article, and I appreciate that clarification. So so let's talk just about those probability studies then. Um, the the second group of studies you reviewed the popu well. The population-based studies do suffer from some methodological deficiencies, correct? The population-based uh, studies? Yes. All studies suffer from methodological deficiencies, but the population-based studies are the best ones that we have to address this question. Those are uh, very large population-based studies that uh, the entire United States Public Health Service relies on. Those are the only evidence we have for prevalences of mental disorders in the United States. Thank you. And because none of these studies was a priori designed to assess mental health studies was a priori 
designed to assess mental health of LGB groups. They were not sophisticated in the measurement of sexual orientation, correct? Yes, those were general population studies and the LGB group were uh, basically whoever happened to have been gay within the general population was included by virtue of the probability sampling. The studies classified respondents as homosexual or heterosexual only on the basis of past sexual behavior rather than using a more complex matrix that assessed identity and attraction in addition to sexual behavior, correct? Uh, I actually, if I said that, I assume it's correct, but I actually don't remember that all of them used even the exact same, um, but, but they usually would choose uh, one measure and therefore they don't have a more complex measure. I, I, I don't remember independently that they all use the exact same measure that you just quoted, but... Uh, Please look at page 685 in the second column. It's the second, well, it's the last full paragraph on that page, so it's above the carryover. And about uh, partway down, I'm going to read it to you, it says... After the sentence, the first sentence says that they too suffer from methodological deficiencies, but then then I'll start reading in full. It says, this is because none of these studies was a priori designed to assess mental health of LGB groups. As a result, they were not sophisticated in the me measurement of sexual orientation. The studies classified response as homosexual or heterosexual only on the basis of past sexual behavior. In one year, and there's a citation to a study, in five years, in another citation, or over the lifetime, in a third citation rather than using a more complex matrix that assessed identity and attraction in addition to sexual behavior. And another citation. The problem of measurement could have increased potential error due to misclassification, which in turn could have led to selection bias. Does that refresh your recollection? Uh, yes. I, I don't know if I'm referring here to a particular group of studies, but let me just say that in if this is true about all the studies that I use, it may be, but in general this is true the way you described it. Uh, um, there have been studies of this nature that use not just this one thing, but they all use a, a, a selected measure that they find the most uh, uh, relevant to their purpose. So, so I just can't confirm that all of the ones here I would actually be surprised if they all use this exact same measure, but... Uh, and uh, well, just, just but glance at that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I mean, basically, the, the main point that they do not use the more complex ways of measuring. That I agree with. Thank you. And uh, these population studies also suffer because they included a very small number of LGB people, correct? Correct, but let me just say this is why I conducted the meta-analysis which allows you to, in a sense, increase your sample because you're then aggregating all of them. But uh, on the other hand, you're limited by some uh, maybe sub-comparisons that you might want to do. But uh, to conduct the meta-analysis, I aggregated them to overcome this problem of small sample size. Okay, and... Um Please look at page uh, 688, if you would. And uh, starting at the middle of the carryover paragraph, as you see it on 688, you write, quote, my use of a meta-analytic technique to estimate combined ORs somewhat corrects this deficiency, but it is important to remember that a meta-analysis cannot overcome problems in the studies on which it is based, correct? It cannot overcome all the problems, but in this particular example that you use, it over, certainly overcomes the problem of the sample size. That's because you're, you're adding all of those samples together. But uh, as I said, there's no, there's no method that is like 100% perfect, and, but, but uh, it, it specifically overcomes the problem of uh, both sample size and also what we call sampling error, so that if you just rely on one sample, you might have some specific biases connected with that, but if you aggregate, you know, five samples, then that error will get lost within that bigger uh, uh, number of studies. So that's what it does, but it certainly doesn't, um, for example, overcome the, 
the issue of measurement because they all, you know, you can't change the measures that they use. So, so it Correct. depends on what, uh, you know, you, you're talking about. So it may overcome sample size, but it wouldn't overcome a lack of precision in the definition of LGB individuals, correct? Uh, I didn't say there was a lack of precision, but if there were a lack of precision, I said that they didn't use as uh, 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 the, the measure that they did use could have been precise, but they didn't use a more complex me measure. Uh, but um, it wouldn't overcome measurement we call it measurement error, uh, although it would help because of that question, that, because of that issue that I just said uh, uh, related to sampling error. So, the, again, the best way to explain it is that when you take, even if one study has an error and maybe another one has another error, when you aggregate them all together, uh, um, they all part of it, but the, the, the larger pattern that you see Will, will, will emerge despite different uh, errors that will get, they're much better than if you just rely on the one study with the, one, with the error or with the bias. But still, a meta-analysis cannot overcome all the problems in the study on which it's based, correct? No. And it's important to interpret results of meta-analyses with caution and a critical perspective, correct? Absolutely, yeah. All right. and. Uh, in this 2003 study, uh, you described your conclusions as inconsistent with research and theoretical writings that can be described as a minority resilience hypothesis, which claims that stigma does not negatively affect self-esteem, correct? Yes. And you described your conclusions as inconsistent with studies that showed that blacks do not have a higher prevalence of mental disorders than whites as expected by minority stress formulations, correct? Yes stated that further research must address this apparent contradiction, correct? Yes. Okay, and, and please look at 688 again, or I guess if you're still there, that, that would be great. You, you write, quote, one problem which can provide a plausible alternative explanation for the findings about prevalences of mental disorders in LGB individuals is that bias-related cultural differences between LGB and heterosexual persons inflates reports about history of mental health symptoms. It is plausible that cultural differences between LGB and heterosexual individuals cause a response bias that led to overestimation of mental disorders among LGB individuals. This would happen if, for example, LGB individuals were more likely to report mental health problems than heterosexual individuals. And then your article goes on to identify several reasons why LGB individuals might be more likely to report mental health problems than heterosexual individuals, correct? Yes, that is one of the uh, possible limitations in the sense that, you know, we look at all, as I said earlier when I described the methodology of working on studies, we look at all kinds of potential explanations and try to address them, assess whether or not they're feasible, whether or not they threaten the conclusion, and so forth. So this is one of the things I considered in looking at this evidence. And you found, and you said in your study that to the extent that such a response bias exists, it would, would have led researchers to overestimate the prevalence of mental disorders in LGB groups, correct? To the extent that it exists, it would. And. Uh, all right. In his expert report, Professor Herrick wrote, quote, in addition, lesbian, gay, bisexual people face other stressors. For example, because the AIDS epidemic has had a disproportionate impact on the gay male community in the United States, many gay and bisexual men have experienced the loss of a life partner, and gay, lesbian, and bisexual people alike have experienced extensive losses in their personal social networks resulting from the death of close friends and acquaintances. Treatment related to multiple losses is linked to higher levels of depressive symptoms. Do you agree with that statement? Can I have a first yeah, I, it's paragraph 31, note 13 of the Herrick report, and that, that's at tab two if you'd like to look at that. And it, it's on... Uh, I'm sorry, what page? Tab two, and it's paragraph 31. Okay. It appears to be on, uh, starts at the bottom of page 10. It's in the footnote. If you'd like to look at that. I, I read it. I won't ask you to read it aloud, but if you just 
look at what he writes in that footnote. Which footnote? 13. Starts at the bottom of page 10. Yes. You wanted to read what it says? Uh, just to yourself. I, I, my question is, do oh, you agree okay. with that statement? And I, I already read yes, it. Yes, he's actually referring to something that I wrote, apparently. Yes. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, I, I, I still have a, a fair amount of material. Do you want me to continue? Following. Yes, sir. Yes, yes Your Honor. Uh, please turn to tab 13 in the witness binder, Professor Meyer. Yes. You'll see a document pre-marked BIX 1249. Yes. Can you identify that document? That's another uh, article that uh, I wrote, which was published uh, last year in 2009 in a um, journal that's called Journal of Counseling Psychology. Thank you. And, Your Honor, we, we had a slight technical difficulty with this document. The, the PDF version that we provided plaintiffs and perhaps the court inadvertently had an exhibit stamp on each page, and so that obscured some of the words. Uh, we have corrected that problem in this hard copy, and we can provide corrected PDFs to the plaintiffs in the court if, you, if that's necessary. Copy in... The copy in my binder looks fun. Yeah, the, the hard copy is correct. The PDF, I believe, had the exhibit stamp oh. on every page. All right. Well, why don't you correct that? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. But I, I assume there's no prejudice since the citation and was evident and Professor Meyer wrote it. Uh, and I, I would like to move that into evidence, DIX 1249, the version without the exhibit stamp on every page. Fine. Thank you. 1249 is admitted. Please look at page 23, Professor Meyer. Yes. You write, here lies, but here lies the first problem for researchers of LGB populations. The population's definition is elusive. So defining the LGB population is a potential methodological problem in comparing mental health outcomes of LGB individuals to mental health outcomes of non-LGB individuals, correct? Uh, I, where is it? I assume that it's correct. <laughs> well, I, 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 that last question I didn't read from your report, so if oh. you disagree with it, let me know. You, you wrote that here lies the first problem for researchers of LGB populations. The where pop is that? I'm sorry, it's page tw 23, yeah. the second column, the bottom paragraph. Okay. About the middle. It's the carryover paragraph. You, you write... But here lies the first problem for researchers of LGB populations. The population's definition is elusive. And then I asked you I, I, this question. Is defining the LGB population a potential methodological problem in comparing rates or comparing mental health outcomes of LGB individuals to mental health outcomes of non-LGB individuals? A potential methodological problem. I'm not sure what you mean. What kind of problem? I mean, it's as I said, it's a, a um, in this article defining the population, regardless of LGB or, or any population, is the first step in conducting a study, and any study faces the challenge of definition of the population because if you want to sample, you kind of, you know, you have to know who it is that you're sampling from and there's, there's a variety of steps that one takes in doing this. This is nothing specific to LGB populations and some of the quotes I use here are just methodological issues. So when you say it causes a problem, I don't exactly see that as a problem. I see it as just this is part of what we do when we design a study, we okay. look like through all of those issues. My question was whether it can ca causes a potent raises a potential problem. I, you know, I can come up with scenarios, I guess, I, but, but I cannot answer that question in that generic form. I, I would have to see what exactly we're talking about. It doesn't create a problem in principle, the fact that we have questions of definition 
as I said, all studies start with questions of definition. So that fact doesn't create a problem. Now, in the article we were just looking at, you noted that the population-based studies, one of the methodological problems they suffered from was that they did not use a sophisticated definition of the LGB population, correct? That's not exactly how I said it. What I said is that they used a, a th that's perhaps a limitation, that they used one type of a definition. But um, I, I mean, obviously I didn't think there was that great of a problem and obviously the reviewers of this journal didn't think it was that great of a problem and the people who quote it, you know, it's not, you, you, you're trying to suggest there's some big problem, it's not. All right, well, well I'd like to explore that based on what you wrote in this article. And uh, as, I, as you said in the first line, the population's definition is elusive, correct? The population definition is elusive in every study. This is uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, sampling methodologies, Sadman, uh, uh, devotes a lot of effort to try to address that, and I quoted it here. As I said, this is the first step of trying to establish a study. If I wanted to study uh, um, men, I would have to define what age group, is there any particular residence that I'm interested in, you know, a region of the country, this is just basic survey methodology. This is the first step you have to define, and it is it is challenging. You know, if if you are interested in issues related to birth problems, are you going to study women who are at a particular age who are, uh, you know, so, so those are just normal things. Uh, what is a Latino? Uh, do you include Mexicans or do you include uh, Puerto Ricans? This is what I'm talking about. That this is the issue that sampling methodologies confront as they design a study. And that is the first step, is to define the population, which we call the general population. Then you define the sampling population, which is a more specific uh, uh, definition of where you want to sample from. And there's further problems and issues of definition. Well, let's talk about the first question you said, the, the, the general sample, not not specific sample for LGB individuals. Is there a correct definition of the general LGB population? Is there one correct definition? As I explain in this article, the definition depends on your purpose in the research. So just as there's no correct definition of Latino, there is no correct or one correct definition. It is correct if it is responsive to the research questions that you are trying to answer. So it is only correct in that sense that did you do a good job in defining the population so that you, you're getting at the population that you're intending to study. You're, you know, we talk about the, the kind of theoretical population and the actual population. So it is correct only in the sense that you correctly sample the population of intention. So if I wanted to study Latinos and I defined it as Mexicans and uh, Puerto Ricans, there's nothing incorrect about it because I didn't include another Latino group if that's what I was interested in. So in the same sense here, there's a variety of ways that you can measure uh, what we're calling here in a gener general way LGB. So for example, you might want to measure the behavior as the only thing that you're interested in, in which case that would be a correct thing if, if, if it makes sense for your purpose. Okay, so I, I want to ask you two yes or no questions if it's possible. First, there is no one correct definition of the LGB population, correct? For the purpose of particular research. Okay, second, definitions of sexual minorities vary, correct? All definitions, by definition, vary. You know, if you're talking about definitions, they vary. All right, let's be more concrete. Let's look at page 24, at the first full paragraph. You write, and this is a starting with the second, or the, yes, the second sentence of the, of the first full paragraph in the first column on page 24. You write, researchers have distinguished among sexual identity sexual behavior and attraction. 
Although these overlap, that is, a person who is attracted to same-sex individuals may also have sex with same-sex individuals, this overlap is not great. Only among 15% of women and 24% of men do the three categories overlap. In, in this particular study that I quoted, yes. So we have three partially but only partially overlapping concepts that have been used by researchers to define the LGB population. Sexual identity, sexual behavior, and attraction, correct? Uh, again, they, they might have used just one of them or they might have used more. So there, these are three ways of defining that people have used in the field, yes. And, and some researchers may use a combination of those, correct? Exactly. All right. Let's break this down. Uh, first of all, sexual identity. Identity labels, and even whether a person uses an LGBT identity label at all, vary across generations, racial ethnic groups, geographical regions, education levels, and other group characteristics, correct? Yes. Not all LGBT individuals define themselves as LGBT until some developmental tasks along the coming out process have been achieved, correct? Yes. This means that at any point, some people who answer truthfully that they are not LGB will at a later point define themselves as LGB, correct? Yes, exactly, because they haven't yet, a, I referred before to the coming out process, so, so at some point uh, uh, you might talk to a person and they would either hide it or have not yet defined themselves like that and that they would truthfully answer no to the question. Thank you. And furthermore, because of cultural diversity, some people who engage in same-sex behavior, who may be considered by others as sexual minorities, and who may be interested to the researcher, would not identify themselves as LGB, nor consider themselves a sexual minority by any name, regardless of the researcher's definition, correct? Yes. So it's possible that the same individual may honestly give different answers when asked about his or her sexual identity at different times in his life correct? Yes. And it's possible that an individual who engages in same-sex behavior may honestly not identify himself or herself as LGB, correct? Yes. Both of these, well, that assumes, both of those questions assume that an individual gives an honest answer when asked his or her sexual identity. But it's also possible that some individuals will not give an honest answer to that question, correct? Uh, obviously, that's possible that people would not give an honest answer. And in fact, for LGB individuals, there may be particular reasons why they would, might be reluctant to answer that question, correct? Right. As I described before, uh, concealing would be that what I would refer to that. Thank you. Let's turn next to sexual behavior. behavior behavioral definitions also vary, correct? Behavioral definitions of what? Of sexual orientation. Um, I'm not sure what you... I guess uh, they, they could differ in this time frame that people might have looked at, yes. Yes, it, it res so they could look at different time periods. Right. Correct. All right. And because more people had same-sex sex in adolescence, defining sexual orientation as sexual behavior ever includes more people than defining it in the past year, correct? Right, but that will be true for anything. If you look at ever, you get more. Than if you for example, more. you could ask someone whether they were African-American ever or African-American in the last year. That would actually, uh, that is a very interesting phenomenon, but uh, that is also possible. We, uh, uh, African American is an identity, so the identity part of it, uh, it could vary, and in fact it does vary. Um, people who move into the United States, for example, uh, who are, uh, by our definition, African American, may not describe themselves as African American or even black, and there are studies that show that people who come, for example, from the Caribbean who are dark colored, their parents don't describe themselves as black, but their offsprings, after being educated in the United States and socialized, do. So it, 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 definitions always vary. Uh, certainly with African Americans, the term itself is relatively recent. Uh, uh, black was used before that, and uh, Negro was used even before that. Um, Senator Reed just got into trouble for using that term. So, so those, those identities 
change and they're responsive to the social context in many different ways, uh, but obviously the, the population itself doesn't change, but how people refer to themselves might change. But for LGB individuals, the variance in the time period you look at can lead to significantly different estimates, correct, of the population? I said, uh, again, that is true for anything. We, we always look at lifetime, for example, versus one year. So if you look at a one-year rate of a disorder, it will be a lot less than a lifetime. Now, there are also different ways in which a definition of sexual orientation that focuses on attraction might vary, correct? Yes. All right. Now, the size of the LGP population might vary a great deal depending on how sexual orientation is defined, correct? Right. right thank you. And please look at tab 12 in the witness binder. You'll find an exhibit pre-marked DIX 1248. Uh, and wait, I'm sorry. Page, oh, 1248. 12. Yes. Sorry. Yes. And uh, can you identify this document? And I, I apologize. It doesn't have a cover sheet. It's an article you wrote with Laura Dean and others entitled "Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Health Findings and Concerns." that was published in the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. Is, is that the document? Yes, that is that. That is actually uh, a report that tries to summarize some of the findings, uh, health findings. And I, I believe this is also PX1004, which I believe is in evidence. I can check that. Could I, could I ask the court to confirm that that is Laura Dean Meyer finding uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual and transgender health findings and concerns? Okay, so, that, that, so that's in evidence. All right. Please look at page 135 in the exhibit. It's a, it's a long, lengthy exhibit, and that's towards the, not quite the end, but towards the end. Yes. And... Uh, in the second full paragraph, in the second column, you write, quote, Recent national studies estimating the percentage of the population that falls into each of the three broad dimensions of identity, behavior, and attraction show that 1 to 4 percent of the population identifies as lesbian or gay, 2 to 6 percent of the population reports on same-sex behavior in the previous five years, and up to 21% of the population reports same-sex attraction at least once in adulthood. And I'll skip the citations. And you, then you go on to say, therefore, depending upon how it is defined and measured, 1 to 21% of the population could be classified as lesbian or gay to some degree, with the remainder classified as bisexual or heterosexual to some degree. Correct? That, that's what it says here. And... Um Obviously, again, the depending, you can, depending on the definition that you use for defining a population, you will get different uh, rates. If it's more expensive, inclusive, then you would get a higher rate than if it is less expensive and inclusive. Now, 1 to 21 percent seems like a great deal of variance. I, I don't think anybody uh, uh, would say that attraction is a true um, measure of LGB what we're talking about. So I think one of the things is when you, when you measure things, you realize that it is not exactly the way you think uh, it is. So attraction is a very, very uh, fluid thing in the sense that, uh, for example, um, I, a, a woman tends to have less inhibitions about saying, oh, this other person is attractive. That doesn't make her a lesbian. Uh, because she said that. So that's why I'm saying it's a definitional thing. For me, in my studies, I use identity, which is the standard that uh, we use in the U U.S. Census, for example, not, not on uh, LGB, which is not measured, but let's say on race. So, um, you know, th those things are the same issues in measuring any kind of group's identity. 
uh, if you wanted to, uh, for example, measure race by skin tone, you will find that you will have a huge number of people who maybe have a darker skin tone but are not identified as black. So to me, the attraction, personally the, as a researcher, I don't use the attraction definition because I find it very broad. Uh, and I use the identity when I am interested in issues uh, such as the ones we discussed today, but I might use behavior if I'm interested, for example, in HIV-related risk. So, so every researcher uses definition based on the purpose of their study or survey or whatever it is. Thank you. And, and Your Honor, I, I'm, I had more methodological questions, but I'm going to skip ahead. I think we've dwelt on that long enough. And, uh, Thank you for, uh, right, I appreciate that clarification, and Your Honor, I would move DIX 1248 into evidence then. Well, so admitted. Now, Professor Meyer, it's your opinion that limiting marriage to opposite sex couples causes minority stress for LGB individuals, correct? That limiting, can you repeat? Yes. Now, it is your opinion that limiting marriage to opposite sex couples causes minority stress for LGB individuals, correct? Yes, as I described earlier. And it's your opinion that minority stress causes a higher prevalence of mental disorders, a higher prevalence of certain symptoms of distress that don't rise to the level of formal disorders, including mood, anxiety, and substance use problems lower levels of well-being and a higher incidence of suicide attempts, correct? Correct. Now, does limiting marriage to opposite sex couples cause minority stress for all gay and lesbians or only for lesbians or gay couples who wish to marry? I would say um, all because of, as I explained earlier, it is the messages it sends. So, so you can think about the event of marriage in a sense and say, well, it would only affect those people who want to marry. But the message that I described earlier of rejection or disapproval clearly applies to all gay people. So they would all, you know, I, I can't predict what every single person sees this, but, but they would... Uh, there would be something that affects, as I said, the social environment, regardless if you're personally interested in getting married. It is the message, in this case, in the constitutional amendment that demonstrate that, that it is of interest, or the meaning, as I said before, the social meaning. So it affects all of them and not just those, not all LGB individuals and not just those wishing to marry, correct? It has the potential to affect, you know, I never said that, that minority research doesn't affect every single person in the same way. It has the, is a potential. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Are, are you aware that same-sex marriage has been legal since 2004 in Massachusetts? Yes. Do LGB individuals suffer from a lower prevalence of mental health disorders in Massachusetts and in California? Um, well, the, the first answer is I don't really know, but that's not how I, I wouldn't expect it exactly in that way that you're suggesting that that would be the test of that because uh, Massachusetts is not, uh, you know, an isolate in the United States, and you know it would be more complicated for me to assess. Uh, uh, so, so that alone would not um, change everything. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just one aspect of it, and certainly I would think that people in Massachusetts who are gay uh, would feel more uh, supported and um, welcome, so to speak. So in that sense, it would reduce the stress that they have uh, somewhat. But, but your answer is you don't know, correct? Well, I don't, I don't have a data on that. You don't have data. Okay, right. thank you. Do LGB individuals suffer from a lower prevalence of mood, anxiety, and substance use problems that do not meet the criteria for formal psychiatric disorders in Massachusetts and in California? Um, 
Again, the study wasn't done in the way that you're describing it, although a study was done looking at states where there's greater uh, um, rights for gay and lesbian people, and it did show those things that you're alluding to. So it wasn't exactly done in the way that you're saying. It wasn't Massachusetts versus California, but in general, in the United States, states that offer more protections, uh, gay and lesbian populations there fare better than in in states that do not offer such protection. So to the extent that you can uh, uh, use that as a suggestion that, that it does have this effect that you're alluding to, but I don't know if a study that compared California to Massachusetts on any of those outcomes. Okay, and, and I, I, w I was planning to ask you about the other outcomes, but the answer would be the same. Right. I, I, I don't know if a study that tested it either way. Thank you. Are you aware that same-sex marriage has been legal since 2001 in the Netherlands? Um, I, I'm going to believe you on that. I, I, I'm aware that I'll it's represent legal. to you that it, that <laughs> okay. it was. Do you have uh, do, do LGB individuals suffer from a lower prevalence of mental health disorders in the Netherlands than in California? I actually don't know the answer to that. Although there there are studies that. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Would your answer be the same if I asked about the other outcomes you identified? Right. As well? I don't. I don't know. I don't know the comparison. Honestly, I don't know that. Uh, I can tell you the rates of all of the disorders specifically to California, so I couldn't compare them. Most of the studies that I relied on were national studies that were not separated by state. Okay. Thank you. Now, you are aware that California allows same-sex couples to register as domestic partners, correct? Yes, I've learned that. And you believe that, quote, domestic partnership has almost no meaning and to some extent it's incomprehensible to people as a social institution, correct? Yes. And I, I apologize, I said, quote, that, that's, that was from your deposition. Correct. And for opposing counsel's benefit, I'll identify that as the transcript at page 89 to 11. I believe I talked about it today as well. Yes. And you believe that domestic partnership reduces the value of same-sex intimate relationships, correct? It reduces, yes. Okay. And if domestic partnership and marriage were both available to same-sex couples, you think they would probably not choose domestic partnership, correct? I would think that. How are you doing on time, Mr. Bielsen? Fifteen minutes. All right. Uh, I'll try. I, that may be slightly optimistic, but I'm, I'm oh. cutting a lot of... I'm trying to cut a lot of chaff from the wheat. Talk the less wheat gets... <laughs> okay, please please uh, turn to page or tab 14 in the witness finder. Yeah. Now, I'm going to represent to you that this is a California statute governing domestic partnerships. Okay. And I'm going to read you part of this and we could read it all, but I, I'm not going to read it all. If you look at Section A, it says, registered domestic partners shall have the same rights, protections, and benefits, and shall be subject to the same responsibilities, obligations, and duties under law, whether they derive from statutes, administrative regulations, court rules, government policies, common law, or any other provisions or sources of law as are granted to and imposed upon spouses. Were you aware that California law treated domestic partners in this manner? I am um, not uh, aware of all the legal issues around it, but I was aware that it is at least approximating the same rights and benefits. But as I said, I wasn't in my testimony or in my reports uh, talking about those uh, benefits and Right, I was talking about the social meaning and the social message that marriage uh, conveys. So I wasn't studying that particular aspect of the... So that does not in any way change your, the opinions that you've offered in the case? No, no. It, it, it certainly is a, 
good thing that, that, that it, they offer benefits, but I'm just saying that's not what I was focusing on. My focus is on the social meaning, the social place of that. Do you believe of marriage. That, oh, I'm sorry. Are you are you complete? I'm sorry. No, it's not. Do you believe that uh, domestic partnerships stigmatize gay and lesbian individuals? I'm sorry. What was the question? Do you believe that domestic partnerships stigmatize gay and lesbian individuals? Yes. Okay. Please look at tab 15 in the witness binder. You'll see a document pre-marked. DIX 1067, and as you can see, it's a letter from California Assembly Member Jackie Goldberg. You can see it concerns legislation titled AB 205. I'm going to take your word on that. Yeah, and if, if you look at the heading under it, it says AB 205 will provide registered domestic partners with a number of significant new rights, benefits, responsibilities, and other a number of significant new rights, benefits, responsibilities, and obligations. And I'm going to represent to you that this, that AB 205 was enacted into law, and the, the principal portion of that law as amended is the statute we were just looking at. Okay. Okay. Please turn to the last page of the exhibit. And please look at the italics, the italicized statement about two and a half inches up from the bottom of the page. Mm -hmm. Yes. It says, this bill is sponsored by Equality California. Other advocacy organizations that collaborated on the drafting of this bill include Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, National Center for Lesbian Rights, and ACLU. Yes. Are you familiar with Equality California? Uh, yes, I believe they're the organization that uh, opposed uh, Proposition 8. Right, and in fact, you contributed money to the Equality <laughs> California's <laughs> no on 8 campaign, correct? I should, have, I should become familiar with them. Do you believe Equality California would sponsor legislation that stigmatizes LGB individuals? Do I believe that they intend to stigmatize? No, but I think that that doesn't change my answer to the question about domestic partnership. So whatever their intention was, I'm sure, to better the lives of gay and lesbian individuals in California, uh, but nonetheless uh, having a second type of, of an institution that is clearly not the one that is desired by most people is stigmatizing. All right. And if I were to ask you the same question about the involvement of Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, National Center for Lesbian Rights, and the ACLU, your answer would be the same, correct? Exactly. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, I would like to move DIX 1067 into evidence. Well, uh, 1067 is in. I'd like to direct your attention to tab 18. <coughs> you'll, you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1020. Can you identify this document? Got it. Um, I don't believe I've seen it before. It says, Article Proposition 8 in the Future of American Same-Sex Marriage Activism. But I have not read it before, I believe. And, and who is the author? Jeffrey Redding. Or are you familiar with Jeffrey Redding? No. Not, I, 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 I don't think so. I don't remember the name. All right. I, I'm going to... Uh, I'm, I won't question you about that document then. Have you done any research to determine whether, since it adopted AB 205, and that's this bill we were just talking about, LGB individuals in California suffer from worse mental health outcomes than LGB individuals in any jurisdiction that recognizes same-sex relationships as marriages? No. Okay. 
Now, at your deposition, I would like you to turn to, uh, you made a statement, and I want to confirm that it was, in fact, a statement that you made. And it's, uh, turn to tab seven, if you would. That's a transcript of your deposition. And look at page 149. And the pages are a little confusing. There's four on each page. That's okay. And it's, it's actually page 38 in the continuous pagination at the bottom, if that's helpful. I got it. Why are you offering it? I, I was going to ask him whether he agreed with it. Perhaps I should ask him whether he agrees with it first, and then if he doesn't... Why don't you ask him the statement? Yes, exactly. Of referring to the deposition? Right. When you speak of a gay and lesbian person whose intimate relationship has not been granted societal approval, would that include gays and lesbians who are in a domestic partnership? Yes. In the same sense that I discussed earlier about the social meaning of marriage versus domestic partnership. Okay, now let's look at the deposition transcript. Uh, it's lines, page 149, lines 16 through 20. And you can continue past that if you need to for context. Could, could you, you don't need to read it aloud, but could you read that and tell me whether you gave that testimony at your deposition? I give this. Uh, you say this at your deposition. I don't have an independent recollection, but uh, I, I read it here, and I presume that's correct. And the statement was the answer you gave to the question today was yes, and the answer at your deposition was no. I describe here when I talk about these unions in the sense of the impact on stigma. I'm really not considering domestic partners domestic partnership, and admittedly they have many benefits, including maybe something that you were referring to just recently. But the, in terms of the impact that I'm referring to here, I wasn't talking about domestic partnerships. And, and as you said, you have no reason to, to think that you didn't give that testimony, correct? Right, but I, I'm, I'm really not sure what the context of this is and what, what we were talking about before, so I don't know that it is replicating the question that I just agreed to. Uh, but my answer is that, you know, what I just told you uh, is uh, uh, what I still believe. I, I don't know that that necessarily in any way contradicts that. Well, no objection. Come on. <laughs> part of the record as well. This is from page 153, starting line 3. Question, perhaps domestic partnership is confusing and not well understood. Does it minimize the significance of the relationship? Answer, yes, because as I explained before, domestic partnership is compared with marriage. It refers to a similar thing. It refers to a couple being together, let's say to a union, and therefore, when you use domestic partners, an obvious comparison would be with marriage. Now, in this case, or in any case, really, domestic partnership is offered clearly as a secondary option, not as the most desirable option. Very well. Shall we move on, Mr. Nielsen? Yes, we shall. Uh, Professor Meyer, you believe that laws are perhaps the strongest of social structures that uphold and enforce stigma, correct? Yes. I believe I wrote that. Yes. As we've discussed, California recognizes same-sex relationships as domestic partnerships with essentially all the rights of marriage, correct? As, yes, I have to, again, I, I have no knowledge of the law specifically, but I, I understand that that's the case. Are you aware that California law prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in housing? I take your word for that. I think uh, I know that, but... Are you aware that California law prohibits discrimination on the sexual basis or on the basis of sexual orientation in businesses provisions of services? Again, I'm I'm not independently aware uh, necessarily of all the legal issues of protections, but um, I I'm aware now that you're telling me that. Okay. Are you aware that California law 
prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and employment. Same answer. Okay, and and I, I could go on and on, and in the interest of time, I won't. But let me just ask you this. Leaving aside the question of marriage, are you aware of any other state whose laws reflect less structural stigma than California? Leaving aside the question of marriage, as I said, I'm not as familiar with the details of the protections either here or in other states. Um, so I, I, it's going to be a very, I cannot answer that. Okay. So the answer is I don't know. Is correct? I just cannot answer that. I don't know what the different legal, I would have to study this and look at those. Very understood. Thank you. Now, uh, you talked about Proposition 8 sending a message about the values of, uh, value of gay and lesbian relationships in your direct testimony. Did you intend by that to offer an opinion about the purposes of the people who drafted or voted for Proposition 8? No. All right. N no further questions, Your Honor. Very well. Any redirect, Mr. Dassault? Good afternoon, Dr. Meyer. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, almost evening, but also afternoon. Um, just a couple things I wanted to um, follow up on. Uh, Mr. Nielsen spent a good bit of time this afternoon with you talking about your work in minority stress and social stress theory and the implications of that work with respect to groups not lay, uh, gay and lesbian individuals, but let's say racial minorities. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Now, is the point of, of this discussion that you have found in some of the research that certain racial or ethnic minorities, while they experience some stressors as a result of minority status, may not experience the same health effects as a result? Correct. That's specifically with African Americans or blacks in the United States. Now, and, and I should just correct, this is not that I found this, but this is a finding that definitely is um, in the literature. It's not, it's not all my studies uh, empirically, but there are studies. I found it in the sense that I read about it and so forth. Now, now Dr. Meyer, do you have any views as to any differences between, let's say, the African-American minority community and the minority community of gay men and lesbian that might explain some of the differences in terms of the outcomes that flow from stressors? Well, of course, as I mentioned, the reason we look at differences in the patterns of results is exactly to, as I said, uh, improve our models. And one of the things that we therefore analyze, and again, it's not just me, uh, we begin to look at, well, what is different between those two populations that might help us understand the workings of these social stressors? Uh, in terms of African Americans' findings, uh, there are several uh, uh, areas of further study that we're interested in. Um, the first one that is most uh, often advanced is the, uh, and, and I'm, I'm discussing this in comparison to gay and lesbian here, uh, is that uh, while African Americans are definitely uh, exposed to racism, um, in their socialization process, especially earlier on, they're typically exposed to greater benefits of the resources that I described before as coping and social support for the uh, very simple fact that they typically uh, grow up in uh, black communities. Of course, there might be some uh, unique uh, experiences, but there's evidence that being socialized um, by your family and, and educated about racism, being taking part in, uh, for example, institutions, black churches that have um, for really decades, if not uh, centuries, been in place to, to 
combat the effects of racism or, or the, 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 the messages of racism. So as a person growing up and being socialized, an African-American person uh, benefits from this social support, this affiliation. As I described earlier regarding gay and lesbian people, uh, that is not how they grow up. Most gay and lesbian people, like most people in society, internalize very negative attitudes and they do not have a, a, along the way a access to gay supportive services and so forth until a later point where they have already uh, come out and, 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 you know, really made that big step of affiliating themselves with some of those supports. So this is one thing. Uh, uh, one, Let's sorry. move on. Let, let me be sure I understand this. So in the African-American community, for example, typically an African-American youth growing up would commonly be surrounded by African-American siblings, parents, grandparents, perhaps community, church, friends, et cetera. Is that Correct. Right? Okay. But with uh, gay men and lesbians growing up, they may not have the same community support and socialization support? I would say they definitely do not have the, those type of support, the, the, the uh, equivalent type of support addressing gay and lesbian, uh, uh, an affirmative uh, gay and lesbian approach. As I said, it's almost, uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, in many times we've found that within even families, gay and lesbian individuals are shunned, are, are, are uh, harmed in many ways, uh, including violence. So. So it's, it's almost like the direct opposite of uh, the support. Are you talking about uh, African-American uh, gays and lesbians or <laughs> non-African-American Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in this comparison, we're comparing uh, the, major the, the overall African-American non-gay with overall white non-gay. In a previous uh, response, we were discussing a different study that looked at gay African-American versus gay white, in which I was talking about the added element of racism. But as uh, Mr. Nielsen uh, pointed out, this finding uh, is also true in the general population, non-gay population, where African-Americans also have lower rates, and therefore that's why this analogy uh, it, it makes sense in the way that uh, 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 we're discussing, um, I was answering. But when comparing the gay and lesbian population to the African-American non-gay population, your testimony is that there is more socialization and support in the African-American community that may explain a difference in certain outcomes. Yes, that's, that's one of the differences that may explain. More socialization and support among uh, non-gay or more socialization and support for African-American uh, gays and lesbians? Non-gay. Non-gay. So, so the, let me just clarify. We're talking about two different comparisons that are joined only by the general theoretical perspective of uh, how uh, social stress could affect people. So the analogy here is that African-Americans being themselves of course, subject to racism, should have a parallel finding that we find in the gay versus straight in African-American non-gay with white non-gay. It's a very different, uh, but, but you expect some kind of uh, parallel that, that if the stress related to prejudice is affecting them, then it should affect also blacks. And the questions here were, well, why isn't it true for non-gay African-Americans versus non-gay white, where it's true for gay versus straight, regardless of color. So, so this is really going to a whole different area that is not pertinent specifically to what I testified regarding gay and lesbian population. This is expanding towards a, an analysis of broader sociological theories and looking at them parallels in the findings across groups and across right. ideas. And let me clarify, the, the line of questioning that I want to follow up on now was a line of questioning from Mr. Nielsen suggesting that the, if the theory of minority stress is taken from the gay and lesbian minority population to the African American non-minority population, would you expect exactly the same health outcomes? 
and does the fact that you might not see the same health outcomes in some way suggest that the model doesn't work? Do you recall that discussion? Right, and, and my answer is that, that it does not indicate that the model doesn't work, it indicates that there are differences in the characteristics of, th that this is not a perfect comparison. Uh, there are differences in the characteristics of uh, race in terms of blacks versus white, non-gays, and the, 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 from that comparison, and the comparison of gay versus straight. And a major difference is that blacks are socialized with a lot of, uh, or, or with variety of uh, access to support for their race that, that, that comes to counter some of the effects of racism, whereas gays are socialized with homophobia and without in their families and original communities, say, access to this to a similar gay related affirmation in some of the exhibits we've seen today we've seen the term minority stress and we've seen the term social stress are those the same things as, as i uh, responded to mr nielsen social stress can be maybe thought of as a broader category and within that, uh, in the African-American comparison, people have talked about racism as stress. In the non-gay, African-American versus white, people have discussed it as a racism as stress. So, so I would put it within the general social stress uh, uh, approach, because here we're looking at racism, whereas in my examples with gay and lesbian versus heterosexuals, we're looking at homophobia and, and some of the other things. So, so they're not obviously the same, but there's some theoretical uh, um, parallel there in that way that you study those different populations and different comparisons. But when you use the term minority stress in your research, are you referring generally to all minorities or specifically to gay and lesbian people? No, as I said, minority stress, which is a term that uh, I helped popularize, uh, refers to sexual minorities, and it is almost exclusively used in the literature uh, with reference to sexual minorities, and I would dare say many times uh, referring to my own articles on that matter. And the four processes that we spent a fair amount of time on this afternoon uh, that embody minority stress, are those processes of general application or specific to the gay and lesbian population? Obviously, they're specific to the gay and lesbian population. Let me ask about one in particular, concealment. Would concealment be a similarly significant issue when you're talking about the gay and lesbian population as compared to a racial minority such as the African-American population? Not, not, not at all in the same way for obvious reasons, although... <laughs> The, the, the answer is no. There, there are some instances where somebody may be able to conceal his black identity, but uh, it is mostly we don't think of concealment when we think about the model of racism. Let me also ask you, in this comparison of the gay and lesbian minority to the African American minority, about the issue of structural stigma. And you talked about the role of law. Today in America, are African Americans subject to legal structural stigma in any way comparable to Prop 8? Well, uh, uh, obviously, um, as I said, this would be another difference between the two populations when I was saying there are several differences. Uh, uh, this is a major difference. I believe that um, uh, at least since 1964, there are no legal uh, uh, types of racism in the United States. So, th so in terms of the uh, power of the law and the state, uh, there is no endorsement of racism. That does not mean that racism is abated, but uh, certainly it is not parallel to what we were discussing today in terms of the structures of uh, the law. Is there any racial minority in the United States that's denied the right to marry? I don't think so, but... With this issue of the extent to which a theory of minority stress or social stress applies to, let's say, racial minority groups. Does any of the fiction or findings in that area in any way undermine your view 
that minority stress operates in the lives of gay and lesbian people and adversely affects health? No, and there's no evidence for that. There's no real um, challenge uh, in terms of uh, findings that are um, this, this confirming. There's certainly not all the findings are always perfectly uh, uh, as, as you would like them, but they're majority of the studies done in the field, as I said, and, and many of them that I quote, uh, uh, do not lead me to have doubt in the veracity of what I was uh, testifying to. Uh, and the situation with African Americans, as I said, is of great interest to me, as is the issue around gender, that is men versus women, and is something that I'm very uh, motivated to study, but it is really because of my intellectual curiosity and interest in, as I said, specifying the model better, understanding how do these differences that we were just describing, for example, and there are others, how do they play into this causal change that I was describing earlier. So, so it is of interest, but it doesn't lead me to doubt anything regarding the specific case of minority stress in lesbian, gay men, and bisexuals, which has been my work. Now, Dr. Meyer, Mr. Nielsen asked you a series of questions where he presented you with a hypothesis, and then he would ask you whether a particular study or analysis was inconsistent with that hypothesis. Do you recall that? Yes. Is one of the purposes of a study to test whether a hypothesis is true or not true? That is the purpose of the study. Mr. Nielsen also asked you about stigma and domestic partnerships, and he read you some examples of uh, certain rights groups supporting domestic partnership. Do you recall that? Yes. I asked just a couple follow-up questions about that. Assume hypothetically that you have no right to marry for gay and lesbian people and no right to domestic partnership. Is it your view that gay and lesbian people are stigmatized? Oh, they're stigmatized, as I showed Regardless of this, there's, this is, as I said, an added uh, block in the stigmatization, and I think a very important and, and forceful one in the sense that it has the, the power of the state and all that, but it is not the only stigma, if, if uh, I understand you correctly. Clarify. Hypothetically, if you had a state in which there was no right to marry and no right to domestic partnership, uh -huh. is it your view that that would stigmatize gay and lesbian people? Well, I think not having the right to marry would stigmatize them as in the same way that it stigmatizes them in this case. And then alternatively, if in the same state, gay and lesbian people are denied the right to marry, but they are given a domestic partnership that is valued differently by society, would you view that to be a stigmatic effect as well? Of course. In a sense, you're, you're, you're actually making a clearer statement of stigmatization when you have this dual system because it is not only that you're denying them the marriage, you're also saying this is marriage is highly valued and therefore you cannot get that part. So we're giving you something that we're calling something else. So in some ways you could say, at least in the way that, that again, it's not in a tangential way, but you could say that the message is even more severe, uh, but of course it's kind of a silly comparison because I, I agree, I would say that if they does not offer marriage, that alone is a stigma. But certainly if you have two sides to this and you're saying you can only get to uh, the back of the bus, uh, that is quite more uh, uh, stigmatizing. Thank you. I have nothing further. Very well. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. You may step down. Thank you. And uh, I think we'll perhaps pass on Ms. Zia until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Is that agreeable to everybody? Yes, Your Honor. All right. See you all at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Any, whoops, a, a housekeeping matter. One quick house, two, actually. The, uh, that might change the order of our witnesses tomorrow. We may end up with Dr. Lamb as our first witness, followed by Ms. Zia. And then, and then the other issue is if someone tomorrow we could address we could address the issue of the documents that are under seal pursuant to the protective order. I will be much appreciated. I'll be happy to do that. Um, have you worked out an agreement with these um, individuals that we 
Is that about it this morning? Still working on it as we review the documents. We were going to try to nail that down this weekend so we could report on Tuesday. I see. And exactly what documents are you going to raise tomorrow? Th there are three documents that were filed, filed with our, our administrative motion um, to file under seal that are documents that were produced um, at pursuant to the most recent order to compel uh, they've been produced under the protective order. Oh, are these the documents that I asked for the uh, response to yes. at the close of proceedings today? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think yesterday, and I think the response was filed. So ah. the, the uh, pr proponents have filed the response. We're, we're not going to file a reply. I'm just ready to argue whenever you're ready to hear it. All right. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. 8.30 tomorrow? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.